Hello, and thank you for joining me today. Coming up in the news, an update on Puerto Rico and the damage to the aviation infrastructure there, which is making it difficult to fly in and out of San Juan. And an update on the FAA reauthorization bill in Congress. We're now just two days away from the FAA having to possibly furlough non-essential employees. And if you use an iPhone or iPad, we'll tell you why you might not want to update right away to iOS 11. And you've got to hear this story from Ireland about a GA pilot chasing his aircraft. We'll let you know whether he was able to catch it. Then later we'll be talking about the top priorities when flying IFR and about briefing the approach prior to flying an instrument approach. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Trescott. I'm here to help you with aviation tips and advice to keep you safe as a pilot or student pilot. And I'm going to share with you my over 40 years of experience as a licensed pilot author. And back in 2008, the National Flight Instructor of the Year, where I was selected to represent the 96,000 CFIs here in the United States. Now, last week, our show talked about check ride itis, that feeling of anxiety a student or pilot gets before or during a check ride. So if you missed that episode, check it out, because that might give you some tips on how to avoid anxiety. And please stand by, because the news starts now. First up, Puerto Rico and the hurricane relief effort. Several sources here. This one comes first from the Washington Post, where they report that the hurricane and its 100 mile hour plus winds demolished the National Weather Service's NEXRAD radar station for the island. It's unknown how long it will take to repair that station. According to an NWS spokeswoman, she says that once we assess the radar, we'll have a better idea of a repair timeline. She said, we have not been in a situation like this before. And I posted before and after pictures is pretty amazing to see how that uh, radar station was absolutely decimated. You can find it on our Patreon page at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And from USA Today, it's not just the weather radar that's been knocked out, but also the approach radar used by ATC in uh, San Juan. They say that airlines began commercial flights this past Friday, starting with just two flights a day per airline. With the air traffic control tower out of service, they had to have much greater than usual spacing between the airliners, which has greatly reduced the capacity at that airport. American Airlines reports that they flew about 300 airline employees in from Miami to assist in everything from baggage handling to ticketing, but with a computer system still down, reservations all had to be confirmed with phone calls to Miami. Also from the WashingtonPost.com, they mentioned that the FAA has implemented a slot system to manage the demand for ramp space at the airport and to safely separate aircraft in the air. They say the number of commercial flights allowed to operate will increase as the FAA restores radar, navigational aids, and other equipment damage during the storm. The United spokesperson said that conditions on the ground are extremely tenuous and challenged by a lack of power, transportation, and hotels. And in that story, they mentioned that while there is food for purchase, some families couldn't withdraw money from automated teller machines that remain out of service throughout the island. And from the FAA.gov website, they say that hurricane recovery efforts are now supporting more than a dozen commercial passenger flights per day at the main airport in San Juan. They say that the airport handled nearly 100 total arrivals and departures a couple of days ago, including military and relief operations. Now, you may recall we talked about a week ago about the mobile air traffic control tower that they brought into St. Thomas. Well, they had to pull that out of St. Thomas ahead of this hurricane and then take it back to St. Thomas again. They are currently shuttling uh, air traffic controllers daily from San Juan to St. Thomas to uh, staff that mobile air traffic control tower. Preliminary FAA damage assessments have identified a number of critical radar and navigation aids that were destroyed. The FAA is bringing in replacement systems to the island by air and by sea. Now, a long-range radar in the Turks and Caicos returned to service a couple of days ago, giving air traffic controllers a better picture of planes and helicopters operating in the area. Now, technicians are trying to make their way to a second long-range radar site on Puerto Rico. The last two miles to the site, however, are through a rainforest that has become impassable. So technicians are forced to use chainsaws to try and clear a path for themselves and the replacement equipment. <laughs> 
And from CBS News, this is via Twitter, David Begno, a CBS reporter, reported that 3,000 shipping containers packed with food, water, and medicine have been sitting at the port in Puerto Rico since Saturday. The governor reports that they're having trouble reaching truck drivers to get them to the port to distribute the relief supplies. It's unknown what the problem is, but you can well imagine truck drivers may be dealing with their own problems at home. And an update on Operation Airdrop. You may recall that we interviewed Doug Jackson last week. They are working on plans to fly supplies to Puerto Rico. A report on their Facebook page says that as of yesterday, San Juan Center is still out of service and that air traffic control at the San Juan Airport is being done through a handheld radio. And Remote Air Medical, you may recall our interview with Stan Brock, is putting together a plan to lead a parade of airplanes to San Juan and adjacent islands, possibly around October 15th. If you happen to have a Cessna 210, A36 Bonanza, or similar aircraft that can fly long distance and carry significant weight, and you're willing to volunteer your services and aircraft, consider contacting them through their website at RAMUSA, that's R-A-M-U-S-A dot org. And back on the mainland of the U.S., a storm of a different kind, and one, frankly, that's less important than the disaster in Puerto Rico. From Reuters, the U.S. House of Representatives on Monday failed to approve a bill to allow the FAA to continue to operate. Authorization for the FAA, that's the money, is set to expire on Saturday, September 30th. Now, the bill would have extended the agency for another six months as Congress continues to debate whether to privatize air traffic control. The bill, which was considered under the fast track rules, required a two-thirds majority. However, despite the vote of 245 to 171, it failed to achieve the required two-thirds. One problem with the bill? Well, it was not strictly about FAA reauthorization. In a fashion that's typical for Congress, it had lots of other pieces of legislation attached to it, including extension of some health care programs and a tax credit for companies that employ people in certain disaster areas. Now, if it had been a clean bill with just the FAA reauthorization, it's a near certainty that it would have passed. Congress now has just two days to pass a bill. Otherwise, the FAA may have to start furloughing employees and shutting down non-essential services as early as this weekend. And if you use an iPad or iPhone, you might not want to rush to upgrade to iOS 11. From ForeFlight on Twitter, they say, we're still testing iOS 11 and ForeFlight to ensure compatibility. We'll let you know when we're done testing. And from iPadPilotNews.com, they say pilots should always be cautious about updating to a brand new version of iOS when it's released due to the importance of the iPad and aviation apps to our flying these days. Well, they say Apple and app developers have to test the software extensively months in advance as all new operating systems have undiscovered bugs that need fixing and can cause unexpected device or app issues. So they say it's important to check with your aviation app developer or your GPS ADSB receiver manufacturer to see what they say about compatibility with the next version of the operating system. And iPadPilotNews.com has come up with a page where you can go out and check to see whether or not your favorite app is compatible with the latest iOS release from Apple. They call it their iOS Greenlight program. When I went out there a few minutes ago, they showed only one of many applications as being fully tested and compatible. That's the Wing X Pro 7 applications. All of the others are listed as, quote, testing in progress. Now, I've included a link to their page, and you can find it on our Patreon page at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. They'll be updating that page frequently, so you can go out there often to see if your app is now compatible. And our next story comes from generalaviationnews.com, and this is starting to feel like the ADSB receiver of the week club. It seems like every week we've got a new product to announce. Well, sure enough, Adventure Pilot, the maker of iFly GPS, has unveiled its affordable ADSB receiver. It's called the RXWX. According to officials, the device is built on the Stratex platform, but it arrives fully assembled and ready to fly. It includes the stuff you probably expect now, dual band ADSB in, it's got an internal WASP-capable GPS, uh, Wi-Fi interface for up to four devices, built-in six-axis uh, AHARS chip that'll drive synthetic vision and artificial horizons, a pressure sensor, and a free one-year iFly GPS VFR subscription, which is a $69 value. It's also compatible with any ADSB-capable electronic flight bag app, such as ForeFlight, iFly GPS, WingX, FlyQ, and others. And if I didn't mention it, the price is... 199. 
And our next story is really cool. This comes from AOPA.org. I love hearing about people who use things like this. The Oregon Pilots Association has just named Nadine Kelly as its 2017 Volunteer of the Year. Well, you might want to ask, well, why is that? It turns out that three years ago, Nadine stood up at a Lane County, Oregon economic development meeting to point out what she calls the lack of creature comforts at the airport in her hometown of Cottage Grove. So what used to be a fixed base operation building that had been hauled away years before was then just a bare cement slab with absolutely nothing else to greet arriving pilots. When she wrote a summary of the project, she titled it, We Just Wanted a Bathroom in Cottage Grove, Oregon. Well, lots of fundraising, and a couple years later, they started building in April of 2017. And just four months later, the Cottage Grove State Airport community celebrated the grand opening of a 430-square-foot tourist information center. It features a covered patio area for aircraft viewing. It's got information about hotels, restaurants, shops, covered bridges, lakes, biking, and golf courses, plus a courtesy car and two bicycles for ground transportation. It's got Wi-Fi and, yes, Nadine, it's got a real bathroom. By the way, they sound like a, a fun group of people because they are inviting you to come up next year because on 8 18 18 that would be august the 18th 2018 they want to try a shot at the guinness world record for the largest toga party <laughs> that sounds like fun nadine said i never thought my husband and i would or could have accomplished something of this magnitude we are just regular people with a desire and an idea a lot can happen when people believe and work together boy i totally agree with you nadine so listeners if you know of someone who's an airport advocate who's worked hard and made a difference at a local airport please email me with the details just go out to aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact and we'll share that information with other listeners and in international news, this comes from the irishexaminer.com. The title of the article, Pilot Had to Chase Runaway Aircraft. Well, fortunately, this uh, turned out okay, uh, but it could have been uh, quite dangerous because uh, at least one person is killed in Australia recently under similar circumstances, which is they were hand-propping an aircraft to get it started. Unfortunately, in this case, the pilot said that the throttle was set on a higher setting than he'd had before, and when the aircraft finally started, he was forced to chase it as it went across the airfield about uh, 70 meters. It hit a ditch, went into an electric fence, and then burst into flames. Now, the 54-year-old male pilot had about 400 hours of flying experience. He had also failed to chalk the aircraft or tie down the tail. The upshot of this incident, which was in uh, Tipperary uh, on July 5th, was that the pilot was uninjured, but the aircraft was destroyed. So if you do hand prop aircrafts, this is really serious business. You got to make sure that you don't skip any steps. But I have to admit, I did send a note to my good friend Trevor Kellett, who does a lot of the check rides in Ireland. And I told him it looks like he'll need to be updating the check ride standards in that country to test how fast a pilot candidate can run. So if you know Trevor, say hello to him for me. And also from Ireland, we don't usually do airline stories, but there's a connection here. Many uh, GA pilots are looking to someday work for the airlines. And I thought you might want to hear directly from uh, Michael O'Leary, who runs uh, Ryanair. They, they had a lot of problems here the last uh, month or two. They've had to cancel hundreds and hundreds of flights because they made a scheduling problem in which they let 500 pilots uh, last month and 500 pilots this month go on vacation. And apparently they didn't realize they needed those pilots to fly the aircraft. So he has a few choice things to say about pilots. He starts out by saying he respects them, but listen carefully to what he says. I respect pilots. You, if you don't, if you sit in the cockpit of a plane flying at four or five hundred miles an hour, going in through a landing in 40, 50 feet of visibility, you have untold respect for pilots. That doesn't mean that they don't do a very easy job and that they are very well paid for doing what is a very easy job. I mean, we are in an era now where the computer does most of the flying. They're no longer there doing the flying themselves, but they are very skilled professionals. They do a very skilled job. And like most things where you really need our pilots and our pilots to demonstrate that skill is landing in thunderstorms or fog or in all of those. And you also want to make sure that they always take the safety options. But are they hard work? No. He's 900 hours a year or 18 hours a week on average you know, likely to generate fatigue? No. Um, so, but I think you could not fail but to respect and admire the professionalism of not just Ryanair's pilots, but I think all commercial pilots.
So it's been reported that Ryanair has lost more than 100 pilots recently to Norwegian. And I think I understand why. So folks, choose your employers wisely. And finally, to wrap up the news, from generalaviationnews.com, a $2 million competition has been launched to develop personal flying devices. So if you're a creative type, here's a chance for you to win some money with your good ideas. So this new competition is to encourage innovators to create a safe and easy to use personal flying device. So the uh, initiative is called Go Fly. It's a two-year competition to encourage teams from around the world to leverage recent advances in propulsion, energy, lightweight materials, and control and stability systems to make the dream of personal flight a reality. And the prize money of $2 million will be awarded to the most innovative teams. Now, the teams can be building anything they want. Could be a jet pack, a flying motorcycle, you name it. The criteria is it must be capable of carrying a person at least 20 miles without refueling or recharging and have vertical or near vertical takeoff and landing capability. Now, the major sponsor of the competition is Boeing, and the prizes will be awarded in three phases. Phase one will include 10 $20,000 prizes awarded based on written specifications. Phase two will have four $50,000 prizes awarded to teams with the best prototypes. And then in phase three, they're going to have a fly-off. There's going to be a $100,000 prize for the most disruptive advancement of the art of aviation, a $250,000 prize for the quietest entry, and a $250,000 prize for the smallest entry. And the grand prize winner, well, $1 million for the best overall fly-off score calculated by measuring speed, noise, and size. First registration deadline for teams to participate, April 4th, 2018. So you're going to want to go out to goflyprize.com. We'll include that link in our show notes. And that's the news for this week. Coming up in a moment, we're going to talk about what your top priorities should be when you're flying IFR. And we'll talk about how to brief the approach prior to flying an instrument approach. Plus, listener questions. One listener asked, how can he load a second approach while he's still flying another instrument approach? And I'll share a conversation I had with a client of mine who had a recent engine failure. Stick around, because we'll be right back. And welcome back. Hey, before we talk about IFR, just a few quick updates for you. The first one is whales. <laughs> no, not the country, but uh, those large sea mammals. I watched uh, about five of them uh, from the airplane here a couple of days ago. Uh, so uh, fall is really whale season around here. We get lots of them uh, coming by the bay. And we tooled around over the Monterey Bay at about uh, 1,200 feet. And we could uh, spot them pretty clearly. A couple of them actually came all the way out of the water and slapped down. And that was kind of fun to see, even from 1,200 feet up in the sky. So if you're going to be in the San Francisco Bay Area you want to fly with me either uh, to check out what it's like to fly a Cirrus or to see if we can go spot some whales, uh, let me know. Or if you're looking for Cirrus training at your location or mine, just go to uh, my email at uh, aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact at the top of the page. And let's talk about the survey. I want to thank everyone who has been taking the survey about flight planning tools. We're going to close that out here at the end of September and we'll start a new one. And by the way, the IFR topic we're talking about today, that's because a number of you on the survey said you'd like to hear more about IFR. So at the end of the surveys, I ask you what topics you'd like to hear about. And so believe it or not, I read every single one of those surveys. I might not respond to them, but I do uh, read them. I'm going to have a new survey for October. Look for it. It's going to be on portable ADSB receivers. I'm going to ask you, do you have one? Are you thinking about getting one? How has your experience been with the one you have? Are there any issues you've encountered? And I'm also thinking of getting one or more of the new ones that have just been recently in introduce and that we've talked about here on the show, just to evaluate them, review them, and tell you what I found out when I tried them out. So if there are any of those in particular you'd like to have me review, please let me know. And you can do that in the survey, or again, you can uh, contact me via email. And we run a survey every month. You can always find the current survey by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash survey. Also, people sometimes ask how they can help with the show. Well, first of all, you help by listening and by telling your friends. But I've got business cards, and some of you have been kind enough to contact me and say, yes, I'd like to post them at some of the bulletin boards at airports I frequent or visit. So if that's you, just go ahead and go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contacts at the top of the page, email me your address, and then let me know how many of the business cards you'd like, whether it's one for your airport or a dozen because you're going to post them at all the airports you visit. Yeah. <laughs> 
And uh, another great way to support the show is via Patreon. You can make a contribution toward the show of as little as $2 a month, and the cost will be billed directly to your credit card. I'd like to thank our new supporters this week, who are Gary Rudolph and Randall Weisenbaker. And since this is the last show of the month, that's when we mention everyone who has been contributing at the $20 a month and up level. And those people include Jeremy Zawadny. He's a software developer. Peter Long, who used to be a CFI here in Silicon Valley, now a pilot in Australia. Seth Lake, military pilot and flight instructor in Arkansas. His website, by the way, if you're interested in flight training down there, sethlake.aero, A-E-R-O. Jason Blair, he's a pilot examiner. He runs a blog at jasonblair.net, and he's up in Michigan. And finally, a new person, Joseph Haggerty II. He's a Mooney pilot and owner. Speaking of Patreon, I have posted a number of uh, stories out there, which anybody can see. So, uh, for example, just in the last uh, day or two, I posted a story about uh, a 59-year-old military crash that was unearthed by Hurricanes Irma and Maria and washed ashore. So you may want to check that out. And I mentioned earlier on the show that I posted information about iOS 11, where you can check and see which applications have been tested for compatibility. So anybody can read those stories. Just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and click on posts, which is near the top of the page. While you're there, check out our goals and consider making a donation to support the show. And at different contribution levels, you get different goodies. For example, the $4 a month and above Patreons, they get access to the full script for these shows and the $8 a month and above. Those people get the list of stories that were cut that didn't quite make it into the show. And we thank everyone for their support in whatever way you choose to support the show. Now stick around because in seven seconds, we'll be back talking about the top priorities when flying IFR and about how to brief the instrument approach. Well, in aviation, everybody knows the priorities are aviate, navigate, and communicate. But when it comes to IFR, no one really tells you what the priorities are. And that's a big deal because I see people who are sometimes overwhelmed. They just don't know which thing to do first, and sometimes they get it wrong. So first off, let me tell you what the most important thing is in IFR. I learned this from a flight instructor when I first got my CFI. He asked me the question, and of course, I got it wrong. The answer to what the most important thing in IFR is the next two things. So I know some instructors who will tap a pilot on the shoulder. And at that point, they want them to tell the instructor, what are the next two things that they have to do on that instrument approach? So I will tell you this, you need to constantly be thinking in three dimensions. And those three dimensions are left, right. Do we have a turn coming up? Up, down, should we be making some type of altitude change? Third dimension is speed. Should we be making some speed or power change? Often I see people joining the approach. They know they're making a, uh, a left-right change, but they forget that there's an altitude change associated with joining the approach. So always be thinking in three dimensions, left, right, up, down, and speed. Priorities. Well, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. I tell folks they need to prioritize these three things above all other activities. And those things are one, rolling out onto the heading you've been assigned, two, leveling off at the altitude you've been assigned, and three, intercepting the final approach course. Those things should take priority over everything else. And some of those things include getting the ATIS, briefing the approach, talking to ATC, and anything else at all. Everything else is a lower priority. So you want to make sure that if you're in the midst of doing one of those things, that you complete that task and don't distract yourself by doing some other lower priority task. Now let's talk about each of those a little bit more. Turns, which is number one, rolling out onto a heading. When you first go into a turn, estimate how long it's going to take you to reach your heading. So for example, if you've been told to turn to a new heading that's uh, 90 degrees, you know that with a standard rate turn, that's going to be about half a minute because it takes two minutes to do a full 360 degrees. Now, you don't want to fixate on the DG or the HSI uh, while you're in the turn because if you spend all of that 30 seconds you know, waiting for you to roll out on the heading of the turn, your altitude is probably going to go to heck. You may get too steep in the bank. You have got to keep your scan going. So estimate that, okay, it's going to be about 30 seconds I need to roll out, and then keep your eyes moving on the other instruments periodically checking the DG or HSI to see when to start your rollout. Now, by the way, typically for a rollout, you want to start about five to six degrees before you reach the assigned heading. If you wait till you're right on the heading, well, you're probably going to overshoot. 
Number two, leveling off at altitude. This is a really common error. Let me describe to you what people do. They are in a climb. As soon as they reach the altitude, boom, they pull the power. And then they start to trim. And the airplane speeds up a little bit and starts to climb. And they start to trim some more. And this goes on for 30 seconds, maybe a full minute, because that is not the way to level off at an altitude, whether you're flying VFR or whether you're flying IFR. What I do, and what I think will help you maintain your altitude, and remember in IFR, you've got to maintain it plus or minus 100 feet. When you reach your altitude, go ahead and pitch down so that you fly level at that cruise altitude, but don't pull the power immediately. Let the aircraft speed up until it reaches its normal cruise speed. Then, and only then, pull the power and then trim the aircraft. If you just pull the power, as I described before, you're gonna be trimming all day because as the airplane speeds up, it's gonna get faster and gonna need more trim. So this will make uh, the whole level off procedure a lot easier. Now remember, as you level off and if you leave the power in, you're gonna have to start pushing harder, 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 harder as the aircraft speeds up. But it's gonna be a lot easier to trim the aircraft because you're only gonna to have to do it one time and your aircraft is gonna stay at the particular altitude. Number three, intercepting the final approach course. Boy, the most common error I see on this is that people forget to join the approach. Here's what'll happen. The controller has been giving them a turn, you know, turn to this heading, turn to that heading, turn to that heading. Finally, they get to the approach and the controller says, turn left to a heading of 320, maintain 2000 till established, clear for the RNAV 29 Yankee approach. Now that is a mouthful and people often have trouble reading all of that back. But what they forget is that that moment when the controller said, cleared for the approach. Well, responsibility just jumped from the controller to the pilot. And the pilot forgets that he or she is now in charge of making that last turn to intercept and join the final approach course. So when you hear these words, cleared for the approach, the ball just got thrown to you and it's now your responsibility to make turns, not the controller's responsibility. So people sometimes will fly right through that final approach course they're supposed to join. By the way, another quick little tip, when they say clear for the approach, if you're using the autopilot, Good time to press the approach key. That is if you've got any kind of vertical guidance on the approach. If not, just press the nav mode key on the autopilot. Now, another factor to consider when you're managing your workload is that the highest workload is gonna be at the very end of the flight, and that's when you're flying the approach. So what you really wanna to try to do is move as much of that workload from the end to some point that's earlier during the flight. So do your setup task as soon as possible, get the ATIS information as early as possible. And by the way, if you happen to have in cockpit weather, either XM weather or ADSB FISB weather, you can get the METAR for your destination ahead of time. One difference is it's not going to tell you that it's information alpha, information hotel, whatever. Later, you'll need to actually tune into the ATIS within your within reception range. Now, the reason you're going to have to do that, not just to get the code, is the in-flight weather doesn't give other information that you're going to hear on the ATIS. For example, obstructions. Is there a crane half mile south of the airport? Is there bird activity? Those are all the kinds of things you have to listen to the METAR to actually get. In addition to that code, information alpha, that you'll need to tell the tower as you approach the airport. Now let's talk about briefing the approach. Essentially, this means that you're going to methodically review the entire approach chart or approach plate, as they're sometimes called, and set up as many of the radios as possible for the approach. Now, ideally, you will have reviewed this chart before you even got into the airplane, but there are times when you won't be able to do that. For example, you might not be able to get the approach at your destination that you thought you were going to get, or maybe you've had to divert to an entirely different airport. Ideally, look at the chart before you leave, but for sure review it once you're up in the airplane. And you want to do that as early as possible during the flight, because there are a lot of things to take a look at at the chart. Also, as you get closer to your destination, things will start happening much faster, and often it's the approach briefing that gets cut short, leaving you poorly prepared for an approach that's coming up quickly if you wait till the end to brief the approach. The first thing you want to do is take a look at the title of the approach up at the top of the page. And you want to check and see, are the letters GPS included in the title? If it's not, well, historically, you wouldn't have been able to use GPS to fly the final approach course. However, there is new guidance out that says for VORs, you can actually use GPS even if it's not in the title. However, you must have the VOR a needle displayed. And we'll talk more about that later in another time. But meantime, in general, if you don't see GPS in the title, well, you're going to have to have some other radio, your nav radio, for example, set up to tune in the uh, VOR could be an NDB, tune in the ILS, and so on. 
Also, you want to check in the title to see whether it's a circling approach. If there's no runway number in the title of the approach, there would be instead an A or a B. It's because you're going to be arriving at the airport at more than a 30 degree angle from the runway for a VOR approach, or more than 15 degrees off the center line for a GPS approach, or possibly because the minimums are going to be so high at the missed approach point that it would be virtually impossible to make a straight in landing. So you want to know ahead of time whether or not it's going to be a circling approach or they're going to be more or less aligned with the runway as you come in. Next, you want to note the approach course, which is going to be listed in degrees, and that's the course of the final approach course. If you're using a VOR, that's the number you're going to have to dial into your course deviation indicator uh, so that you can join that particular course. If it's an ILS or GPS, you're not going to have to dial that in, but you will have to uh, just verify that uh, that's approximately the course that you're flying when you're on the final approach course. If, on the other hand, you're using a localizer back course, of which there are relatively few around, but we have one here in Northern California, you're going to take that, and if you're using an HSI, you're going to dial in the reciprocal of the approach course shown for a localizer back course. Next, you want to read all of the notes on the chart. In particular, look for any notes regarding circling restrictions. At many airports, you're not allowed to circle in some directions, usually because there's a hill or some other obstructions. And you don't want to overlook this kind of note. Recently, I was talking with a person who said he's fallen out of the habit of reading the notes on the instrument charts. Wow. And so in the example that I gave him, he totally missed that circling was not authorized at night at a particular airport and that it was in the daytime not authorized south and west of a particular particular runway. So read those notes incredibly carefully because there's just a lot of detail that, uh, that could kill you, frankly, if you don't pay attention to it. And while we're talking about circling, let me just mention briefly that I would avoid circling in the real world at all costs, particularly if you have any weather going on. Hey, if it's a nice day, who cares? Not a big deal. But if the chips are down, you're tired, there's lousy weather, it's night, do not circle at night if you can possibly avoid it. Now, I would actually land with a tailwind up to maybe about 10 knots, provided I had lots of extra runway, rather than circle to land just because the accident rate is so high for, for doing that. Now, in a Cessna 172, if you're going to land with a tailwind, the POH says that for every two knots of tailwind, you're going to have to increase your landing distance by 10%. So you can land with uh, 10 knots. It's going to increase your landing distance by 50%. But often runways are long enough to do that. Next thing you want to do as part of your briefing is memorize the first two steps of the missed approach procedure. Now, you really don't want to be looking down at the chart trying to see what the first two steps are when you're 200 feet above the ground when you should be focused on climbing away. That's just not safe. So make sure you've memorized the first two steps of the missed approach procedure before you start down the approach. Next, you want to work your way across the frequency boxes from left to right. Now, both chart makers, both the U.S. government and Jeppesen, have done a nice job of consolidating all the frequencies in this area. And if you work your way carefully through this box, you're unlikely to miss a frequency. And don't forget, by the way, if you happen to have DME, you're going to have to ID your DME as well after you set it. That's probably the radio that people most often forget to identify. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a G1000, it's got a Morse code detector built in and identifies the station for you. All you have to do is look at the code that's displayed and match it against your chart to confirm that it's the correct ID. Now, continue on with our briefing. You want to note all of the IAFs, all the initial approach fixes on the chart, and determine the one that you're most likely to use. Unless, of course, you're going to be flying the approach with vectors. Also note the final approach fix, or FAF, where you'll have to start your final descent and possibly have to start timing if you don't have a DME or a GPS in the airplane. Also, and this is really important, take note of any neighboring high terrain or obstacles. May not matter if you're in a fairly flat area, but around here I can tell you, for example, if I'm flying into Half Moon Bay, I've got mountains to the right which go up a couple of thousand feet, and if there's a problem, you bet I'm going to start turning toward the ocean rather than turning toward the mountains. So you're going to want to know which way to turn if you have an emergency. And along those lines, go ahead and note the MSA, or the minimum safe altitude for the area. That provides a thousand feet of obstruction clearance within 25 miles, but it doesn't guarantee navigation or communications. Now, a lot of people incorrectly think that the MSA is based on the airport location, but it almost never is. It's almost always based on a nav aid or a waypoint, it might be near the airport. Uh, so note what the MSA is based on. These days for GPS approaches, the MSA is often based on the missed approach point, which is either at or very near the runway threshold. 
Next, take a look at the profile view, and that's essentially a side view of the approach. You want to note the minimum altitude that you must maintain prior to each fix. And also look at the distances between each of these step down fixes so that you can estimate the rate of descent that you'll need to reach the next altitude prior to reaching the next fix. Now, this is probably the most important part of the chart. In fact, this is the information that could kill you if you get it wrong. And yet, I see a lot of people who just steal a quick glance at the chart while they're flying the approach. They'll read the wrong number and they'll start to descend down to the wrong altitude. Often, they're looking at the next leg. And so they're actually descending one leg early before they should be. <laughs> By the way, if you're interested in meeting your maker, descending to the wrong altitude is a fast and efficient way to get to heaven quickly. So I recommend you spend more than just two seconds glancing at those altitudes. You might even take the time to write them down or circle them or whatever it helps you so that in the heat of the moment, you're looking at the right number. Now, sometimes people will actually confuse whether they're supposed to go down to the altitude number that's published just before the vertical line that marks the next fix or the number that's just after the vertical line. Make sure you know exactly which number you should be looking at. And try and be like the carpenter who measures twice and cuts once so he doesn't make an expensive mistake. It doesn't hurt to double check the chart to verify that you understand exactly what the altitude is that you're supposed to be flying down to next. Also, review the approach categories and choose the one that's appropriate for the speed that you'll be using on the approach. For example, if you'll be approaching it more than 90 knots but less than 120 knots, you'll need to use the category B minimums. A lot of people always use category A, but seem to forget that if they're flying faster than 90 knots, they must use the category B minimums, which are often at a higher altitude than the category A minimums. Also, check the straight in versus the circling minimums. Try to determine in advance on which runway you'll be landing and whether you can land straight in or will need to circle to land. By listening to the ATIS and knowing the winds, you should be able to figure out the runway that you'll be using. And if at all possible, avoid doing the circling approach because of the higher accident rates. And when you're reviewing the approach minimums, don't get confused on which number to use. I'm looking at one of the government charts right now. And the big number, that's going to be your MDA or, your, or decision altitude. That's going to be the altitude you're going to read on the altimeter when you reach the minimums. Next to that is going to be the visibility. And then finally, the smaller number, that's going to be your height above the ground as you cross the threshold or the height above the airport center if you're flying a circling approach. And then the last couple of things you might want to consider if you are using a nav radio, make sure the frequency is tuned in correctly. And then finally, if you're unfamiliar with the airport, be sure about what your runway landing distances are. You don't want to find yourself coming up short at an airport. And that's it for top priorities when flying IFR and for briefing the approach. If you have any comments, feel free to contact me via email. Just go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact. Coming up next, we've got lots of listener feedback and questions. One listener talks with me about his engine failure, and another asks how to load a second instrument approach while still flying another approach. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Hey, a quick thank you to two people who left reviews on iTunes, also called the Apple Podcast app. This week, Bonanza Flyer, he talked about relevant nuggets of aviation wisdom every episode. Thank you for that. And Linear Groove, he's an instrument pilot, so I hope he is enjoying today's episode where we're talking a lot about instruments. And if you want to go ahead and leave a review, just go ahead and use your Apple Podcast app or go into iTunes, and you can do that. Let's go to listener feedback. Uh, this actually comes from Bonanza Flyer. He says... The latest episode on checkride anxiety was spot on in my opinion, as I had just recently completed a checkride for a commercial certificate. I just wish this had been available a few weeks earlier. Thank you, Max, for sharing your wisdom with us. Well, I'm sorry I got to it as quickly as I could. And here is a series of uh, text messages that I exchanged with a client of mine a couple of weeks ago. You may recall, if you live anywhere in Northern California, we had an incredible heat wave over the Labor Day weekend. We set uh, record temperatures uh, for history. I think uh, San Francisco was 105 degrees, never been that hot ever before on any day in history. Anyway, it was on that day that uh, this gentleman wrote, I had my first ever experience with vapor lock at 9,000 feet on Saturday. And by the way, he flies a series. Uh, 
Cirrus SR22. He said, I switched the boost pump off and hit the assist button, which would be to do the leaning for the aircraft. And shortly after that, the engine stopped. He said he was climbing very slowly with the pump on during his uh, climb to altitude because it was so hot, he wanted to keep his CHT temperatures down, the cylinder head temperatures. Well, I wrote back to him and I said, wow, very interesting. And you apparently also survived a heart attack as well. Of course, I, I would have had a heart attack, I think, if my engine quit. And I continued, so this is exactly the kind of situation where I've heard of this happening. Aircraft sitting on the ground on a very hot day. Fuel gets heated up as the aircraft sits there. Hot fuel vaporizes in the lower pressure of the high altitude that you reach in cruise. By the way, did you notice rising EGTs? In the Columbia 400 factory training, which I did up in Bend, Oregon, they told us the vapor bubbles in the fuel line would result in rising EGTs, which was a clue that you need to turn on the boost pump. And this gentleman replied, I was climbing very slowly with the pump on, that's the boost pump, because it was so hot, I wanted to keep the CHTs down. And yes, that's a good practice. Anytime you're climbing, if the temperatures are hot, you want to lower the nose, decrease your uh, climb rate, which would be increasing your climb speed on the airspeed indicator. He said, when I switched the uh, fuel pump off, the boost pump, and pulled up the assist page, the EGTs all went straight to the top in about two seconds. Well, that tells you something is wrong if your EGTs just shoot up, something's wrong. They said, and then the engine stopped. And I wrote, interesting, I was guessing EGTs would rise as they do in the Columbia 400. I've been in Boston for a week and I heard rumors that it might have been a little warm back there. What time of day did you leave? What was the surface temperature? And had you refueled or did you take off with what was already in the tanks? He said, I added fuel. The temperature was 41 degrees C, which translates to about 106 degrees Fahrenheit. He said up at 9,000 feet, it was in the high 20s. So that would translate into around 80 degrees Fahrenheit at 9,000 feet. I ask, any idea how many gallons you had before and how much, many gallons you added? He says, I added about uh, five gallons to each side. It already had fuel at the tabs. So I said, okay, sounds like you had about 60 gallons of hot fuel, which by the way, would be very unusual for Palo Alto because the temperatures there are pretty cool being close to the ocean, but that that would not be uncommon at other airports. I also said, as I recall, the Turbo SR22 POH says to leave the fuel pump on for a half hour after reaching cruise, which gives time for the fuel to cool. And I said, you might want to try that if you encounter similar situations in the future. I don't think that's the procedure for the normally aspirated aircraft, but not a bad idea if you've got hot fuel. Because yes, I had to admit it, it was a good experience. I always make sure fuel flow is stable after I turn off the fuel pump. He says, I did some troubleshooting and fuel flow was all over the place without the fuel pump on. So now you know about his uh, engine failures on really, really hot days. If you're sitting on the ground, the fuel is going to be hot. If you climb up to higher altitudes, some vaporization may occur and that could lead to an engine failure, in which case you definitely want your fuel boost pump on and restart the engine. And here's a listener feedback from George. He says, uh, you ask whether listeners have enjoyed your hurricane shows. I was dubious, but then really did on evening bike rides along the canals here in Belgium. I particularly enjoyed getting to know the Stan Brock story. That's uh, about the remote area medical. And he said, I found it quite inspiring and I've made a donation to them. George, thanks for doing that. I think that's awesome. And here's an email that I got from uh, Timothy. This came in actually a couple of weeks ago. He said, we have not seen this notum before, and it was a notum about GPS outage, without actually having a GPS outage. But last week, I experienced total GPS signal failure on dual GPS receivers, iPad, and iPhones. The outage lasted about a half hour and 100 miles along a Victor Airway between Barstow, California, and the Arizona Barter. That was uh, Victor 12. He said, all GPS functions, including position, ground track, cross track air, uh, distance of VOR, et cetera, was lost. He said many GA and airline aircraft similarly reported GPS failures as a failure of any navigation system is a mandatory report to ATC, and that's true when you're flying IFR. And some aircraft, like the Phenom 100 jet, have autopilot function compromised without GPS augmentation. He said for a short time, the Garmin G1000 replaced the course deviation bar, that's the little bar that goes left and right on the HSI, with the letters DR for dead reckoning, but after several minutes, even this calculated data was no longer displayed. 
VOR navigation continued to function as usual, and ATC continued to monitor the flight, but they too wanted an immediate report when GPS navigation was regained. He said, it is very unnerving to lose all the information we are accustomed to having. He said, we have indeed become children of the magenta. And if you don't know what that means, you can go out to YouTube, search on children of the magenta. And it was a presentation given at American Airlines back in 1997, where they talked about how flight deck automation was really reducing pilot skills as newer pilots were simply following the magenta line without fully understanding some of the underlying systems. Hey, Max, this is Daniel. I had a question for you about instrument approaches. I was doing some practice on the G1000 sim the other day, simulating an approach into Palo Alto where I'd have to go mist and then redirect to an alternate at San Jose. Pretty good, pretty uh, typical scenario for uh, out here. And what I found in the G1000 is that I could not have two approaches loaded at the same time. When I tried to add the ILS at San Jose, it uh, defaulted to Palo Alto. And finally, what I came up with is either I had to delete the whole flight plan or I had to manually uh, insert the San Jose uh, approach. But the problem was that cleared out my hold. And uh, since I was still on the way to the hold, I wasn't there yet. I wanted to keep that in because I had the autopilot in nav mode to reduce my workload. So I'm wondering what you'd recommend about how to fly an approach to an alternate when you'd like to keep the hold procedure in the flight plan on a G1000. Thanks. Dan, thank you so much for your question. This is a classic problem with the G1000, and there's no really great solution with the current version of the software. So if you're flying one instrument approach, for example, you might be headed out to the missed approach hold, and you want to now load a second approach, that's going to wipe out your current approach as well as the hold that you're trying to fly. That's true even if the second approach has the same missed approach. For example, there are approaches down off of the Salinas Airport, which both have the same missed approach. If you're flying the missed approach for one approach and then load the second approach, which has the same missed approach, you no longer have course guidance for the missed approach because you can't fly the missed approach unless you've first flown the first part of the approach to get there. So this is a problem. Here's how I deal with it. As you're flying toward the hold with the first approach, go ahead and start to load the second approach and it could even be to a, a different airport if uh, you want to fly to approach to a different airport just as you start to load the approach press the clear key which lets you get out of the approach name then you can scroll up to the name of the airport put in the name of the new airport go ahead and select the approach for that airport do everything you would do to load the approach except do not push the final enter key so that way you're all ready to go and all you have to do is you know, continue to fly your prior approach. And the moment you're ready to go, hit the enter key, bang, you've got your new approach loaded. And that should solve the problem for you. Now, there are some good solutions. For example, if you're flying a Cirrus Avidyne, which has a pair of Garmin 430s, and that would be true for most any aircraft that would have a pair of Garmin uh, GPSs in it. First, you want to make sure that the Garmin 430s are set up in a master-slave configuration. That's so that the first Garmin automatically cross-fills any flight plan entered into it to the second GPS, but the reverse would not be true. If you enter a new flight plan into the second GPS, it would not automatically cross-fill back to the first GPS. Then while you're in the hold doing the first approach, load the next approach onto the second Garmin 430 while continuing to fly the hold with the first Garmin 430. Finally, when you're ready to part the hold, use the manual cross-fill command on the second GPS receiver to copy the second approach into into your primary receiver uh, GPS number one. Now there is hope coming for the Garmin G1000 in the Cirrus Perspective. In the very latest version of the Cirrus Perspective software, I have seen that you can load two instrument approaches simultaneously, and I expect that that feature will soon be available in the latest Garmin G1000 software update. So hang on, relief is on the way. And speaking of relief, this just in, the House and the Senate have passed down a stripped-down version of the bill to reauthorize the FAA for six months, and that's now gone to the president for signature. Hey, that's all the time we have for today. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on the show, I'd love to hear from you. Please go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener questions so that you can record your question and I'll play it on the show. Or if you want to send me an email, just go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. Send me an email about anything. Love to have your feedback. 
And if you were thinking about buying a Cirrus, I'm your man. Give me a call early in the process, and I'll help you with uh, understanding some of the trade-offs between the new and the used aircraft. And I can also help you move your aircraft across the country when you identify one and train you in it as well. I'm one of the 80 Platinum CSIPs around the world. I specialize in the Cirrus and love working with people in that aircraft. By the way, if you love this show, please share it with your friends. Show them how to find it on their smartphone. Until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. 